We're so happy to see you here. You don't know how happy we are. It's been, it's been a year of a lot of changes. It's been a hard process to get here, but once you arrive, you forget the journey. So we're thrilled to be here with you. Um, my name is Sue Ellen Lazarus. I'm the director of the festival. Um, for those, um, so to those of you who are live here, um, many of you are at home streaming this. We want to give you a special welcome to the Martha's Vineyard Book Festival Summer Series. So thank you so much. It's our, it's our particular pleasure to welcome the 22 authors who are participating in the festival this year. Um, many of them came with their partners, and for many of the authors, it's their first visit to Martha's Vineyard. So a particular welcome to them. Um, we are proud to claim you, you 22 authors for the weekend. We're proud of your tremendous achievements, of your beautiful prose, of your research, of your activism, and for making us smarter and more interesting by reading you. We have an impressive array of talent, a Nobel laureate, a Pulitzer Prize winners, a Penn Faulkner winner, New York Times bestsellers, filmmakers, activists, advocates, a senator, a congressman, lawyers, psychologists, strategists, scientists, and some exceptionally talented writers. You're doers, you tell stories, you make things happen, you help us understand the world in new ways. In planning this year, we wanted to be edgy, timely, and interesting. And we feel pretty confident that with this group, we are. Uh, in planning the panels and moderators that you will hear over the next few days, there were so many synergies that many of the authors are serving as moderators. As tonight, we have Walter Isaacson interviewing Daniel Kahneman. We like this model. It gives you the opportunity to see the authors more often and in different roles, and we'll talk about more of that in just a bit. Um, in addition to welcoming you here tonight, our job is to make you feel safe. Uh, wear masks if you feel it's too crowded. We're all outdoors. I, I, don't, I finally just took to writing on our, on our website, we are outdoors, we are outdoors, we are outdoors, because we needed to confirm that a lot. Um, there will be reception on the other side of the building following uh, tonight's discussion. We want to particularly thank the Martha's Vineyard Museum for giving us a new home and their trustees, led by Kathy Weiss, and their new, fabulous new director, Heather Seeger, for making this happen. So um, this was a partnership that came together very efficiently, and we're thrilled to have this new home and be able to be here. Where are Kathy and Heather? Are they nearby? Can I have them stand up? <laughs> Thank you. Um, other sponsors are the Vineyard Gazette, our media sponsor, and tomorrow night we will be celebrating them and their 175th anniversary with a panel on journalism. Um, we also are working closely with a bunch of Grapes Bookstore. We are doing the book selling for them, but we they did all of our book buying for us, so big thanks to them. Um, there's many people who make this happen. Uh, I stand up here and I give a speech, but it's really, there's a whole network of people who've worked very hard to make this happen, and I've seen them in action. Um, from the volunteers here tonight to the staff who work, I, I, it will take too long and you won't get to the evening if I listed them, but my heartfelt thanks to them for making this all work. Um, so if you are wet, uh, if you didn't get a parking space, Please, uh, be, don't be mean to the volunteers, be mean to me. Because <laughs> we, 
we've overpromised things, but we we appreciate your patience. We ap appreciate your good nature, and with that, it is now my pleasure pleasure to welcome Daniel Kahneman and Walter Isaacson. Walter Isaacson has been the chair and CEO of CNN, the president and CEO of the Espen Institute, and the chair of Teach for America. He serves on the boards of numerous organizations, including United Airlines, Bloomberg Philanthropies, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Society of American Historians, and the New Orleans City Planning Commission. He's a professor of history at Tulane University. But what Walter is probably best known for are his elegant biographies, which are both scholarly and entertaining. Leonardo da Vinci, Steve Jobs, Einstein, and Benjamin Franklin. And his new book, which he'll be discussing on Saturday morning, The Code Breaker. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you who will introduce Dan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sue Ellen. And boy, everybody should really thank Sue Ellen. She's been doing great work. I know I keep emailing her, and um, she brought the reins just in time to bring everybody uh, inside. Well, of all the titles that were thrown out from congressmen to this, that, and the other, I think the coolest title is Nobel Prize winner and laureate. <laughs> so, Danny Kahneman, thank you for being with us. We know you as a great behavioral economist. You've been at Berkeley, you've been at Princeton, and uh, now you're in Greenwich Village having a good time. And, uh, and uh, a whole series of great books, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, is a great bestseller. And now we have Noise. And so that's the book we're gonna talk about. And let me begin by asking you to tell me the difference between noise, which is when a whole group of people have the same information, but they make different judgments. What's the difference between noise and bias? Well, um, I've been a student of bias all, actually all my, all my life, and the work on bias is what I'm best known for. But in recent years, I've become interested in, in the other half of, of error, and the other half of error is and in, to introduce those two notions, let me say that we think about judgment, and when I say we, I mean my co-authors, and I, Cass Sunstein, Olivier Siboni, and I wrote that, this book together. We think of judgment as measurement, as a species of measurement. And judgment is measurement with the instrument of the human mind. And if you think about this, we assign numbers, we assign adjectives, we assign uh, diagnoses, all of these are judgments, and all of these, in effect, we can think of as measurement. Now, in measurement, in the quantitative kind of measurement, there is a theory of error and accuracy. There's a mathematical theory, and there is a way of thinking about uh, noise and about bias. So it's easier to explain bias and noise in the context of measurement, but it will extend very directly to the context of judgment. So if you think of a line and of a very fine ruler, and you are going to measure the length of the line repeatedly with the same ruler, well, in the first place, what you already know is that if the ruler is fine enough, you are not going to get the same measurement more than once. Every measurement is going to be different slightly different from every other one. And now, so very few of the measurements, in fact, probably none will be exactly accurate. Some will be too high, some will be too low. And you can measure the error. The error is the difference between the measurement and the true value. And some errors are positive and some errors are negative. You overestimate or you underestimate the length of the line. The average error is known as bias. So you can have a biased 
measurement, measuring instrument. You probably have a, a bias scale in your bathroom. Uh, and, and you also, what you certainly have in your bathroom is a noisy scale. At least I have one in my bathroom. When I step on and off it repeatedly, uh, which I sometimes do because I wrote a book about noise, uh, I, I don't get the same number. By a few tenths of a pound, it varies. And that depends, because I have a very cheap scale, I suppose, that depends on how I stand on it. This is a species of errors of measurement. Now, the variability of error, that's noise. This is what we call noise. And in this book, we talk about judgment noise, which is the variability of judgments that should really be identical. And mm -hmm. as I said, the average of, of the errors is bias. And what is important, I think, is that in the theory of error, and there is such a thing, there's a mathematical theory of accuracy, which is actually the basis of measurement in all the sciences. And it's a little over 200 years old, and it's tied to the name of Carl Frederick Gauss. And in what you have there is the expression that is the common measure of error, of global error, of global inaccuracy, in the square of the bias plus the square of the noise. And this is important because what this tells you is that when you conceive of error, bias and noise, have, there is a basic equivalence in their weight. And this is sort of odd because I'm sure you have thought very little about noise until tonight, and you've thought a lot about bias of all kinds. There is bias of discrimination, there is, and there is cognitive bias, the kind of systematic errors of judgment that I have been studying for most of my career. So that's noise, and that's bias. And the main point that, is, that I want to make here is the following. When you talk about judgment, it's a matter, it's a definition of judgment that you do not expect perfect agreement. When you say about something that it's a matter of judgment, what this means is that you're expecting some disagreement. Mm -hmm. The reason that we wrote a book called Noise is about the disagreements are much, much, much larger than expected. And it was this finding when you, uh, that I made accidentally a few years ago, just the finding that within an insurance company there is so much more noise than people expected that when underwriters look at the same risk and assign a dollar number to it, the dollar values are actually there is a number. They, they were five times as variable as the executives in that insurance company expected. So that if you took two underwriters and you looked at the difference between them, the average difference was 50% of, of the number that they were estimating, which is huge. And you get similar things when you look at judges. So the reason there is a book mm -hmm. is uh, that there's a lot of noise. There's much more noise than we expect. And and noise turns out to be quite neglected relative to bias because all well, of you let know me a take lot the judge's bias. example to see if we can make more concrete what you just said. Suppose there are twenty judges and they each have the same facts in the same case, and they each do a sentence that's different. Some sentence the person to five years, some to two years, some to seven years. If it's random, that would be noise. They just have different with the same facts, they make a different judgment. If, however, there's a group of judges that sentence all short people or all, you know, Italian people uh, differently, that would be bias. Is that right? Well, it's interesting because if you have judges who are looking at the same case and some of them uh, are biased, say, if the defendant is young, some of them are biased in favor of, of uh, young defendants and others are biased against them, against young criminals. Mm -hmm. Then you may see that overall there is no bias, there is just noise. So when you take individual judges and, who are biased, the differences between them, the difference between their biases creates noise overall. 
So noise becomes a problem in a lot of fields. Let's stick with sentencing. I mean, it's just downright unfair that if 20 defendants each have the same case and have done the same thing, different judges sentence them to a different time frame. Explain what Judge Marvin Frankel did. Well, uh, Judge Marvin Frankel was, uh, was shocked by, by the fact that, in effect, a defendant in criminal justice picks, well, it, pick, it doesn't pick anything. Uh, the defendant is faced with a judge, and this, the, this is, in effect, a lottery. And the size of the lottery, the, the, the severity of the sentence, is determined by that lottery. And to give you a sense of the extent of it, there was a classic study done, inspired by uh, Judge Frankel a long time ago, with 208 federal judges who were shown the same 16 cases, shown all the details that one would need, in effect, to decide on a sentence. And they all set sentences to each of the 16 cases. Now, just to give you a number, uh, the average sentence for the 16 cases was seven years in prison. And if you took, for a case that had seven years in prison on the average, if you took two judges at random and you looked at the difference between them, the difference that you would expect to find is four years. Hmm. So in 50% of the cases, actually, the difference would be larger than four years. The average difference is four years. So that a defendant really faces a lottery, and this is much more severe, but it's very similar to the lottery that somebody faces a customer uh, who is going to get a quote from an insurance underwriter, faces a lottery because different underwriters are going to get So what did we do under. for sentencing reform because of that? Well, what is, uh, that's, there's quite a story about that. So Judge Frankel, uh, he advocated against the injustice of it all. I mean, he pointed out that for the same sentence, he had examples of people who had stolen a small amount of money, and one of them uh, was in uh, jail for three weeks and the other for 15 years. So that was the range that really shocked him. And he managed to get Senator Kennedy very interested in that. And S Stephen Breyer. And, our... and Stephen Breyer. Yeah. But Senator Kennedy eventually passed in the Senate. I mean, he was instrumental in passing sentencing guidelines. And the sentencing guidelines were, they were not compulsory, but they defined aspects of the, of the offense that should determine the punishment. And they, and they set ranges for the acceptable punishment. Those were the guidelines. The guidelines were based on previous sentences for the same offenses, so that the average was not supposed to change. This, this reform was not supposed to make justice more severe or more lenient. It was just supposed to reduce noise. And they were imposed. And the judges hated them. And they hated them because there is an old tradition that if you're a judge, you feel that you have a sense of justice and that the, your sense of how severely somebody should be punished, that defines justice for you. And all you have to do, is, your job as a judge, is to incorporate every aspect of the unique case that you are judging and then have, have a, an intuition, a judgment as to the proper, uh, proper severity judgment for that case. So there was real opposition among judges. Some years later, the Supreme Court changes, changed the guidelines from compulsory to not advisory, discretionary. That is, in effect, advisory. That the judge had, even before, there had been some latitude for judges to break from the sentences, but they had to, from the guidelines, but they had to explain themselves. That requirement fell off. And a couple of things happened that since. 
In the first place, noise is back. So the noise that was obviously reduced by the guidelines, there's clearly increasing variability, which indicates that the same sentence is, the same crime is going to be punished very differently, depending on, on that lottery of justice. The second thing that happened was that the judges almost universally were much happier with the new system than with the old. And so- But is that just the ego of the judges? I don't, I think this is how they perceive their job. And when you, and there is a sense that justice is served by treating each case as unique. But also justice is served by treating all people equally. This is a different principle, <laughs> it turns out. And you know that's a principle that I would advocate, that obviously fairness requires that similar cases be treated similarly. But that other principle, that a judge has to look at every case as if it were unique, that is extremely important to judges and to their self-image and to their, and by the way, it's not only judges. Uh, I had a cousin, a famous lawyer uh, in Israel, and, and I asked him about a case that he was dealing with. I asked him, uh, on, on average, I mean, what happens in cases like this? And he looked at me in anger, and he said, every case is unique. You're not even supposed to think like that. Now, when every case is unique, what you get is noise. You get a lot of noise. Now, at the other extreme, you could almost have it done by an algorithm, by a machine that says, here's all the facts, here's what the sentence should be. That would seem, though, also problematic. Well, uh, it's, it seems very problematic. And it, and it is very problematic, I think, because we have, we have a stronger, there is, we draw a strong distinction between the natural and the artificial. And between the natural and the artificial, we always prefer the natural. And so when- Wait, wait, is we, that a bias though? I think, I personally think it is a bias and I personally think it is an error. But the fact is that if there is, somebody is going to have a, uh, you know, a poor medical outcome because of an error. We are much more shocked if the error was caused by an algorithm than if it was a medical error. You can think of self-driving cars. Self-driving cars today are safer than human drivers, mm -hmm. but a single accident with a self-driving car is absolutely shocking. Why? Why, why do we have that feeling? I mean, we, are, we understand human error, but Something that is designed is designed to be perfect. So that is one thing. And the other is that the kinds of errors that an algorithm will make, an algorithm that selects people, or an algorithm that sets diagnoses, or an algorithm that drives a car, the kind of mistakes that an algorithm will make appear stupid to people. And we simply don't know, you know what but the algorithm we thinks about the mistakes <laughs> that people make. But the mistakes we would make would appear stupid to the machine. That's, uh, you know, we don't know how to ask machines that question. And so that's why we don't have the answer. Well, you know, but what is clear is machines very commonly, a well-designed algorithm will make fewer mistakes than a human, given adequate information. Let me give the uh, pushback from the humanist side, which would be there's a concept of dignity that gets lost when you do things that way? Well, yes. I mean, there is that, we have that intuition. We have the intuition that, uh, that there's something desirable, there's some dignity to human judgment, which is lacking when you apply an algorithm. What we have to think about, though, can I be heard over this noise? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> noise. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what you have to think about is is relative accuracy. So the job of judges is to pass sentences and to make them just to serve 
just as the job, job of physicians is to make correct diagnoses. And let's move on to that physician one, because that seems, well, never having been sentenced to more than a year or two in jail, uh, I'm not, I'm more, I'm, I think all of us would be more worried if five doctors would diagnose things with a lot of noise, and how do we eliminate that? Well, uh, I hope that people don't get too worried because, in fact, there is a lot of noise in medicine. Uh, the, there is noise of several kinds. I mean, we all know that you need a second opinion, but uh, it turns out that the second opinion is not quite enough to get rid of the amount of noise that exists. And that is even in fairly objective, in what would seem to be objective diagnoses, uh, there is disagreement. There is disagreement among physicians in the diagnosis of strep throat. You know, there shouldn't be, but there is. There is a lot of disagreement among radiologists. And radiolog uh, radiologists who see the same X-ray twice do not agree with themselves. So there is noise within the judgment of an individual that depends on all sorts of things that we don't know. So uh, there is, in, in the book, there is a long chapter on medicine which, which really reads like a series of horror stories. And we didn't make them up. Uh, they were all from the medical literature. Uh, and there is a lot of noise in medicine. But so why hasn't Watson or all these IBM diagnostic uh, artificial intel or machine learning tools, why have they failed? Well, diagnosis is extremely complicated. I mean, there are just many factors. And in, if you are going to have an unspecified diagnosis, and that's what Watson was supposed to do. That is extremely difficult. There are domains of medicine where today algorithms are clearly superior to humans. So uh, in dermatology, for example, it's fairly clear that uh, your iPhone with, with adequate software is likely to be more precise than the average dermatologist. Uh, the diagnosis of breast cancer, the diagnosis of retinal, of retinal problems, they're all done better by algorithm than by people. So when the domain is well specified, we already have algorithms that work. When the domain is more poorly specified, uh, that hasn't been successful yet. By the way, my guess would be it's a question of time. And just as dermatology has been cracked and radiology is being cracked in, in various domains, this is going to happen in more and more fields, that we should expect algorithms to be better diagnosticians than people. Well, let me give you a posit a case in which we could reduce noise without depending on machines. And that would be depending on the wisdom of crowds. In other words, if there's a whole lot of variance, we take a hundred people, a thousand people, ten thousand people, or even twenty people, and say, "Okay, each give your judgment," and the answer will be the aggregate. Absolutely, uh, there is one thing that is guaranteed, and that's by the definition of noise. If you take many observations and you average the observations, you eliminate noise. You reduce noise. Actually, there is a mathematical formula. You reduce noise with the square root of n, where n is the number of observations. So there is a very clear rule. And if n is large enough, noise vanishes, and you're left only with bias as a source of the Now, wait, you said independent judgments. Independent judgments. Can ju you have her judgments that are a problem? Uh, her judgments are going to be a big problem, because her judgments uh, are not if there are n people and they all follow the first one who moves in one direction, then in effect there is one person. So what you want is when you're dealing with multiple judgments, it's essential to have those judgments independent. And if you have enough independent judgments, uh, you are going to eliminate noise, as I said, as a, that's guaranteed. Yeah, Shall you guaranteed. explain a system that you could uh, imagine to do that? Well, I cannot imagine such a system for medicine. I, I cannot imagine, even in the case, say, of uh, grading of essays in high school, 
which is quite noisy. But, you know, to have five teachers grade the same essay seemed wasteful. So, and well, why, not, why don't I put my Tulane student papers online and have a thousand people grade them? Um, you know, there are too many students and not enough people to, uh, to rate them. This is, if you think about it, the, the limitation is practical. I'll give you an example where uh, patents, there is a lot of noise apparently in, in the patent office. So, yeah. And people spend years developing a patent and whether it's accepted or not turns out to be, to a significant extent, a lottery. But if you had to have two judges for each patent, that would essentially double the cost. Or, you know, it would certainly greatly increase the cost. You can't afford it. But don't we have systems now, as we do even with Wikipedia or, or Waze uh, traffic, in which we aggregate people's opinion? We do, but they're not, we do not aggregate people's opinions about a single case. That is, if you think of a single case that appears before a judge, how would you aggregate? So indeed, there are systems, you know, the appellate court uh, has three judges, mm -hmm. the Supreme Court has nine judges. Uh, when it becomes very important, you, you have more than one. But in effect, most justice, well, most justice occurs outside the court, you know, in plea bargains. But most justice is administered by single judges. But is and this why we have a jury? Certainly. Having certainly a jury helps. A jury, it, and interestingly enough, the the deliberations of the jury may not reduce noise as effect, as effectively because it becomes a herd because judgment becomes because, because somebody herd. takes That's the right. lead. That's right. But clearly, a jury of twelve is going to be less noisy than a jury of six. Tell me how this this book and this thinking evolved from your thinking fast, thinking so classic? Well, in, in thinking fast and slow, I was concerned with the systematic errors, with the way the mind produces systematic errors. It was not only about that. I was also interested in why intuitions are correct and when intuitions are correct. But the focus of my work has been on mistakes, and it has been on systematic mistakes. Some seven years ago now, I was consulting with an insurance company, and, and I had that issue with the underwriters. I had the idea of presenting the same case, say, to 50 underwriters, and looking at the vari variability between them. And what shocked and surprised me was the fact that the results came as a complete surprise to the executives of the company they did not know that they had a noise problem. They had a big noise problem, and they were completely oblivious to it. And the book came out of that. And how do you do decision hygiene so that people in this room, in their organizations, or even in their families, can fix this? Well, uh, we coined the term decision hygiene in the book. Uh, and it's an off-putting term, and that's in part deliberate. Uh, if you think of biases, a bias is like a disease. And for a disease, you need a specific treatment or a specific vaccine, which is specific to the agent that causes the disease. When you wash your hands, you're doing something entirely different. When you wash your hands, you don't know what germs you're killing. And if you're successful, you will never know. And so the idea of decision hygiene is procedures that you might take that would, in effect, reduce noise or improve the quality of judgment without being specifically directed at reducing Give one Give me or an another. example. So one example is the example that you emphasize, which is averaging the judgments of many people. This is guaranteed to reduce noise. Another example, and this is the one on which I think we put the most emphasis, is breaking up problems. And there, uh, the, the inspiration comes from studies of interviewing and studies of selecting people for jobs. And in interviewing, there is 
an important distinction between structured and unstructured interviews. The unstructured interviews are what most people do when they are talking to a candidate for a job. They have a conversation and they try to size the, the candidate up. The structured interview is conducted completely differently in principle. You have a set of criteria of attributes of the person that you're interviewing, of the candidate, and you evaluate these attributes one at a time independently of each other. And here again, independence is very important. You don't want one judgment to be contaminated by the other. You make those independent judgments and, and that's important, you create a profile of attributes for that case and only then do you evaluate the candidate globally. Uh, the key here is delay intuition. It's not, you cannot do without intuition, but our strong recommendation is judgment is improved when you delay your intuition until you have broken up the problem and considered Could all the aspects Could that work for a doctor problem. looking at a radiology scan? I don't see how that could I mean, you would have to make a list of signs, mm -hmm. and indeed, we know that this helps. So, for example, in fingerprint reading, there are there, there is a set of signs. Uh, radiology is probably too complicated for a simple set of, but in principle, especially when you have to make a decision and you are considering options, then we have a slogan for that. Uh, we say options are like candidates, so that the the way of thinking that is practical and applicable to interviewing or thinking about candidates, which is breaking up the problem, that applies very generally, I think, to decision problems. Is it a case sometimes where the cost of reducing noise is more than the benefit? Certainly. Um, and an example is for uh, you wouldn't want five people reading high school essays. You could reduce noise uh, in the grading, and we know it wouldn't be worth it. So that that is com often the case. This is, in this case, this is cost. This is simply uh, applying more resources. There are other costs to reducing noise, and there are there there is a loss of the sense of agency when you take people who have been exercising their judgment and you take part of their judgment away and you assign it to algorithm or to, to guidelines some, or to guidelines or to any noise reduction procedure. Even the structured interview is a guideline and it's structured. Well wait, let constraint. me push back on that. It there's a cost to that to the ego of the judges. Let's get to the sentencing. But is there a cost to society? There may be a cost to the efficiency, to the, uh, there may be a cost to morale, and, and through the cost Food in morale, morale the, the, the professionals, okay. you know, this book is about, is about professional judgment, and, and the morale of professionals and the, their dedication to the work is in part, stems in part from the sense of the dignity of their work and the importance of their work and their sense that they're doing it well. And to the extent that you are constraining them, there is a demoralizing, there can be a demoralizing effect. And our recommendation would be do not impose noise reduction measures as a way to humiliate the professionals that are doing but it. Let's but let's take different professionals where we may have different feelings of what we would do. Uh, we may not want to humiliate, say, high school essay graders or something, but wouldn't our view be different when it comes to diagnosing whether our kid has strep throat? Do we care about the ego and dignity of the doctor if the doctor uh, is going to get it wrong? Well. What's going to happen, I mean, it, it is actually quite tricky. Uh, if you think of diagnostic assistants, they're, they're coming online. AI-powered, uh, artificial intelligence-powered diagnostic assistants. This is happening and it's going to happen more and more. And, and to some extent it will change the way the doctor thinks. And may, 
and may not necessarily be for the better. I mean, there will be cases in which the doctor might know better, but, but the fact that there is that algorithm out there may turn them a little more passive than they uh, basically. So is there an optimal the level of noise in each field that you actually want to preserve a little bit of noise so we can all have dignity uh, or whatever it may be? I mean, you know, I think, I think when possibly yes. <laughs> in, there are, it, it really depends on what, what is the type of judgment or decision that we're talking about. In many kinds of judgments or decisions, I really hope algorithms take over. But there are, in the field of medicine, in the field of justice, and in other fields, uh, there are cases where for a very long, in, in the field of executive decision making, uh, it will be a long time before algorithms are ready to, to, to take over. And, and in those situations, the interplay between noise reduction procedures and, and the way that people operate, this has got to be done with, with care. Let me open it up. I see that there are microphones in the aisle, but we're intimate and the rain has receded. So if you want to just ask a question loudly, I can repeat it. Lily, Linton. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll repeat it, yeah, or I'll go to the mic if you can, yeah. Just about the decision whether to take the COVID vaccine or not. And we're so focused on Brian. Yeah. And I guess one question is, is there any, does noise play any factor in the individual decision? And could the government, could we be doing a better job? How can we take this, I'm repeating it from our, our live streaming, uh, what Lily just asked. Um, can we use this concept of noise, and perhaps even other of your behavioral economic concepts, to deal with people who are, say, don't want to take the vaccines? Uh, there is, I think, probably in tomorrow's New York Times, it's online now, uh, the guru of behavioral economics, my friend Richard Thaler, has a piece on vaccine hesitancy. And he's just published a book on nudging people, on how you can move uh, the second edition or final edition of their famous nudge book, how you can influence people to do what is good for them. And in that essay, he says, let's get serious. Nothing will work but coercion <laughs> to, to some extent. I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying, but this is, this is the idea. Uh, uh, well, having come from Louisiana, where it's now quadrupled suddenly, the number of vaccinations, scaring the heck out of people scaring also. Scaring helps. Yeah. Scaring helps. And, and his idea is because they're unvaccinated people endanger the rest of us, uh, they, should be, they should be isolated. They should be made to be alone. Yes. How do you apply your theories to risk, which is based on assumptions about the future? Take North Korea. There is uh, the problem of forecasting uh, is under intensive studies these days, and if you haven't read the book on super forecasters by my friend Phil Tetlock, and uh, I strongly recommend it. And it turns out that forecasting has been studied systematically, the assessment of risks, including North Korea and, and, and its behavior. And, and they have multiple people making predictions, probabilistic predictions, about what is going to happen in a given domain. Like, for example, is there going to be uh, nuclear tests by North Korea within the next six months assign a probability to that. It turns out that the, and you can, because the predictions can be verified as true or false within a few months, they have collected a lot of information on what makes forecasts good and bad. And it turns out that the main source of error in forecasting is noise. That is, it's differences among forecasters, and it's unaccountable differences among forecasters. That is, the world, we 
tend to think, and this is really important for when we're thinking about noise, we tend to think that we see the world as it is, as we do, because that's the way it is. And that may be a mistake, because <laughs> we don't see the world alike. And the way I see the world and each of you see the world, there is more difference there than we expect, because each of us thinks that we see the world as it is. But each of us sees and lives in a different world. And that's noise has a lot to do with that. In order to make Sue Ellen happy, it would be great if you actually could go to the microphones. <laughs> and in the meantime, let me just, whilst we're waiting, uh, ask you about your process. Um, my process is less interesting than your process. <laughs> so I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, I, think, I think many people wonder, I certainly wonder, how do you do it? I mean, how Very have well. you managed to, to make yourself a master of so many fields? Oh, you know, you can learn anything. This is one of the things I've discovered in life. Don't say you, say No, I. everybody <laughs> here can learn anything as long as you want to, especially when it comes to science, which people sometimes get intimidated by, but it's beautiful. And if you spend a little time and you talk and you listen, to, you talk to people and listen, you can get a narrative. And when I grew up, I had this mentor, Walker Percy, the novelist. And he told me there are two types of people who come out of Louisiana, preachers and storytellers. He said, for heaven's sake, be a storyteller. The world's got too many preachers. <laughs> and so my process is to find as your friend Michael Lewis did in his book with you, find a character and make it a narrative. I mean, this is nothing new. The Bible does it that way. You know, if you're ever stymied in writing, you just say the six magic words, which are, let me tell you a story. And if you make it a narrative story about people, it demystifies almost everything, which is what you do in this book, case study after case study. So thanks. Well. Uh I'm still puzzled. <laughs> yes, sir. We're all puzzled whenever we read uh, Mr. Isaacson's books. Uh, reading them is a great pleasure. Uh, my, my question to you has to do with your notion of solving um, noise uh, and using the guidelines. Now, I'm a criminal defense lawyer, so my bias is clearly against the, the, the guidelines. Um, I there's so many things I would like to say, but it's not my forum. I want to pose this as a question, which is, when you say that Judge Frankel saw that there was this disparity in sentencing and that was unjust, the question that I raise is, did he solve for justice by solving for that problem? Because in the end, he created a system which changed the balance of power between the defendant and the prosecutor. He made it re almost imperative to plead guilty, even when people did not think they were guilty. He relieved the government of the burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. He removed sentencing from the discretion of judges, and therefore remove discretion. Is that justice? Well, I would say I don't know whether the guidelines uh, improved justice or did not. All I do know is that the system that Judge Frankel complained about is unjust. I mean, it is unjust for people to face a lottery. Now, the guidelines. Many people have complained about the guidelines, for example, that they're too severe and, and that they favor the prosecution. Although Judge Breyer said they're not too severe because they actually correspond to the average. But I'm not defending the guidelines. All I'm pointing out is there is a noise problem that has to be solved. And uh, leaving it unsolved uh, in the present system I think the present system is truly dramatically unfair and should be reformed somehow. Do you think that justice and fairness are pretty much the same thing? Uh, you 
are driving me beyond my depth. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, my question is a little bit like the last question and a little bit like yours. If you reduce noise, is it not possible that you're increasing bias, and isn't that more dangerous? What is going to happen when you reduce noise is that the only source of error that is left is going to be biased. And interestingly enough, people have the intuition that this makes things worse, because every judgment all the judgments will be predict predictably biased. That is where the intellectual foundation that I mentioned, that, that, about the equivalence of noise and bias, are important. It is true that by reducing noise, you are increasing the relative importance of bias. By reducing noise, you are not increasing bias. Decision hygiene, as we conceive of it, uh, will, is designed primarily to reduce noise, but it will almost certainly reduce bias as well. So I don't think that one is at the expense of the other. I was wondering, um, how do you avoid herd thinking when a group is designated to make a big decision and the senior most member has already made up his or her mind? Uh, this is an, an excellent question. Uh, the process of decision making in groups is really, uh, and the conduct of meetings, uh, they're really very odd procedures because they're clearly inefficient. Uh, what we have in, in group discussions is we have too much effect of the people who speak first, too much effect of the people who are the most confident in themselves, and too much effect of the people who are the loudest. Uh, and, and that reduces, in effect, when you have a group of 12 members, uh, they are the noise reduction is not as it should be, it's much less because you have that accidental uh, determinant of who speaks first, who speaks loudest, who speaks with greatest confidence. The process that we would advocate is a costly process, but it's the only one that will ensure independence of judgment. And this is when there is a case to be discussed, instead of presenting the case and discussing it in the meeting, do homework first, so that everyone will be prepared with at least a tentative conclusion about what the meeting is supposed to do, independently of the others, and have everybody put down their, their judgment independently of the others, and then let the discussion begin. That guarantees, by the way, that people will notice how much noise there is, which otherwise, in the concept of a discussion, people, discussions tend to blur the true extent of noise. So there is a process that, that can be done. It's not, it has its drawbacks, and the, the primary drawback is that it requires people to come ready to meetings, uh, and uh, <laughs> which people by and large don't like to do. But suppose you're making a hiring decision and everybody's interviewed it, a person, and they're at a meeting. Could you have each person have to write down their rank order of who they would hire without hearing what everybody else's opinion? Absolutely, and that's... that's I say this because it's in your book. Yeah, so. <laughs> uh, but that, that process, you know, the, Google does it that way. And it, it probably Google, in the context of hiring people, this is really a specialty of theirs. And what they do is essentially st define the state of the art. And, and they have multiple judges, multiple interviews, and independent judgments. So, and the, the judgments have to be made without knowing what your Absolutely. peers are judging. And do they end up hiring better people than Yahoo? <laughs> it's almost by definition, yeah. by the name Yahoo. Uh, <laughs> if I had to guess, I would say yes. I mean, if Yahoo was still hiring. <laughs> uh. Can you... Uh, stipulate that noise is sometimes a very good thing. For instance, in a democracy, noise is an essential part of the system. And in culture in general, there often tend to be authoritative cultural trends that everyone follows mindlessly. And if people come in and make a lot of noise criticizing it, we get better changes. So isn't there a positive role for noise in systems? Absolutely. Uh, I have defined noise 
in a way that you know you cannot refute because we define noise as undesirable variability. So that uh, and and where is variability undesirable? It's primarily in the case in which there is an organization and there are people who are making judgments or decisions on behalf of the organization. So a judge is not acting on his or her own behalf. A judge is representing the justice system. An underwriter is representing an insurance company. A physician is representing the medical system. And it's the system that is noisy. And that, when you have diversity of opinions on the same judgment. I see absolutely no virtue in that kind of noise. We want diversity of opinions in many places. We certainly don't want all our movie critics to agree with each other. We want diversity there. We certainly want diversity. It's essential to creativity. Diversity of opinions is essential to the existence of markets. And uh, and certainly is essential to democracy. So when, when I'm speaking of noise, I'm speaking really quite narrowly about undesirable variability in professional judgments. Uh, variability and diversity and the richness of existence, I'm certainly, I don't want to speak against those. Uh, I, I wanted to ask about transparency in algorithms. You spoke wonderfully about the fear of uh, resisting algorithms and the loss of the humanity. I guess I'm a little nervous about the other side, that there'll be too much deference to algorithms. I think about bail decisions which are now moving towards algorithms, and it's very hard to refute an algorithm if you're a lawyer in court. Or I think about medical diagnoses and wonder if the progress of medicine would be slowed if is you kind of if the doctors are like well this is what the algorithm says the insurance company will only do what the algorithm says um, is there a way of getting the good from algorithms but making them transparent enough so that the people in the field can judge even if they're not computer scientists uh, here I, I have a disappointing message uh, and and it is this that there have been many studies about cooperation between individuals and algorithms. Uh, one of the best known is in chess, where Kasparov, after he was defeated by Deep Blue, uh, he for several years was claiming that the optimal chess player mm -hmm. would be a combination of a grandmaster and an algorithm. Well, it turns out that there are algorithms now that just don't need grandmasters. <laughs> Uh, the algorithms are way better than the best grandmasters, and now it's the, it, those are different leagues, the human league and the league of algorithms, and there are competitions among algorithms, but the people are not in the, in the running anymore. And so, uh, with respect to bail, and that's an interesting case uh, uh, that we discuss at some length, there the studies are unequivocal that if you apply artificial intelligence, you are going to make fewer mistakes in the sense that if you, keep the, if you keep the same number of people in jail, you are going to have less crime. And if you keep crime constant, you are going to have fewer people in jail. It's a case of clear dominance. And in general, the disappointing message is that when you have a human and an algorithm, and you ask who should have the last word, your premise was that the human was going to have the, large word, the last word. The algorithm has to explain itself to the human. Actually, the data indicates, as in the chess example, that when the, you have an algorithm and a human, the algorithm should have the last word. That's how you make fewer mistakes. You make different mistakes. And the algorithm, the mistakes of the algorithm are going to look stupid in retrospect when you discover them but you make fewer of them if you have a good algorithm. Um, okay. In Bayer, for example, but, we have one. Um, chess is a rules-based game, and eventually a computer can just nail it totally. Are there fields in which humans might always be better than algorithms? 
<laughs> Next <laughs> question. <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, you know, it, it actually. I can't think of any way we can be sure of that. It's going to take a long time. Uh, Artificial intelligence is nowhere near human intelligence. They speak of artificial general intelligence, of an AI that will match human intelligence as a, as a sort of dream. And the optimists are talking of several decades, and the pessimists uh, yeah. are talking of longer periods. But ultimately, it's very difficult to specify what humans can do that an algorithm will not be able to do, because ultimately, what we have in our head is a computer. It's a very efficient computer. It's a marvelously efficient in terms of its use of energy, and, and it does a lot of things that AI cannot do yet. But when, I wouldn't bet against AI, by and large. And I'm not sure, by the way, that AI is a good thing. It's just that I wouldn't bet against it. Well, at least we should root against it then. Go That's ahead. That's possible. Sorry. Last question, because the so, rain has stopped and the bar is open. So, <laughs> so I'll try to keep this short. I, I'm in the medical profession. And uh, if I have a difficult case, one that involves a radiologic interpretation, I and probably 80% of the physicians in my institution have identified a one or two radiologists who bring great expertise and experience to the problem, and everyone else is, in my way of thinking, noise. So, so how do you factor that into your thought process? Well, uh, I think that this is a noise reduction technique. That is, in effect, if you have identified experts and you, and you can identify difficult, difficult cases, then it's a sure way of improving the quality of judgment to pass the difficult cases to the experts. This, this would simply be the rational thing to do. And it would reduce noise as well as bias. Because now, if the experts are really experts, they will agree with each other more than non-experts do. And that's a noise reduction. But we also know those experts are not infallible. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. how do you deal with that? I don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You know, the world is imperfect, and it's not going to be perfect very soon. And, uh, there are, you know, I'm, I'm not proposing, let's, let me put it this way, I'm not proposing really solutions here. More, the main task that we saw in writing the book is, setting, is identifying a problem. And we think that noise is a big problem. And there are some ways of mitigating it. We do not have solutions to it. And certainly, we do not have a general solution to how to make good judgments or good diagnoses or, or good decisions. Thank you. Daniel Kahneman, thank you so much. Thank you. Walter Isaacson and Daniel Kahneman, thank you so much. I, tonight, I think that um, my perception of the world is correct, and this was a most excellent discussion. Um, just a, a couple quick announcements, and I'm sorry. I, when you talk about human error. <laughs> um, but quickly, what? We, what we've decided to do is we're supposed to have a reception. We'd love to have a reception afterwards. We were going to have you walk around to avoid having to walk around. The reception has been relocated, and they'll be passing drinks and hors d'oeuvres right in here, so you could just hang out and visit for a few minutes. If you're eager to leave, um, I think that we have a bag of umbrellas and ponchos that anyone who needs one can grab on their way out. John's holding them up. And finally, some pe we do have shuttles running to the high school parking lot. But if you, ha if you drove and you're parked up here and you're leaving and you don't mind taking somebody in your car to the high school parking lot, that might help them get there faster. So if you could just um, 
think about your friends and neighbors and uh, other people here and maybe drop them off just to save people having to wait in the rain. Thank you so much for coming. We I know I'm standing between you and your glass of wine. We start here tomorrow at 11 a.m. There is a schedule on the info table. There's also the beautiful, the Gazette printed their supplement, and it's here early on the, on the summer series. So pick one up. Thanks. <laughs>